Here we are once again on our Friday motivational series. I'm super excited today because the gentleman that I'm about to introduce you folks to is not only an exceptional business person, he's not only an exceptional motivator, he's not only inspirational, but he's an exceptional human being. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna tell you guys, I've known him for an extremely long amount of time, but there's some people that you meet and you just know there's something absolutely incredibly special about them. And ladies and gentlemen, Bobby Jones is one of those people. And Bobby, thank you so much for being part and, and agreeing to come on board here and motivate and inspire and share your story with uh, all the people in our Match Challenge secret group. Martin. Welcome to the secret group. Yeah, Brian, thank you so much. It's a, it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, I hope I, uh, I hope I live up to the hype of all that because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome to be able to be able to help and motivate people and uh, share my story to inspire. And uh, I look forward to doing that with your your whole group. So this is awesome. Thanks a lot. Awesome. You know, before we jump into it, I'll tell you that uh, he's being extremely modest. And that's just the way that this guy is. He's a modest guy. But, uh, you know, you guys will come to that conclusion yourself through this interview. But uh, Bobby, why don't we start with just like jump right into it. Like, you know, in times like this, when people are under just extreme amounts of pressure, right? I think it's so important to uh, kind of hear stories that put it in perspective. And your story is one of those stories. So I think that's a great start. Like, you know, yeah. People would look at you now and say that it was like an overnight success. Like I saw your building and it's absolutely incredible. Your office is just awesome, you know, but I'm sure it was an overnight success. It was many years in the making. Let's learn a little bit about your background. Where, where'd you start off? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, it's important in times like these to remember that gratitude like is what will help us all emerge on the other side of this and finding, you know, the things that are important and to, to be grateful for in times like this are, you know, sometimes difficult, but it is important. And my story helps me with that. So I have a lot to be grateful for. Um, you know, I grew up in a really, really um, poor family. Uh, my parents were both really bad drug addicts. And I was in and out of foster care uh, growing up. And, uh, you know, with that kind of a upbringing and, and not to make excuses, I was kind of seeing a lot of negative over and over and over again, and it felt so normal for me. So as a result, I started to do those same negative things and get into trouble. And the other side of it was, you know, being poor and going through school, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, you know, when you don't have the nice things that everybody's looking at to judge whether or not you can be in the popular crowd and in the in crowd, and when you don't have the money to afford those things, you look to seek that attention in other ways. And my way was acting out and just, you know, being uh, uh, poorly behaved. And it worked. I got a lot of attention. Unfortunately, I got attention from the police officers too. <laughs> and uh, so I, I got into a lot of trouble and uh, ended up uh, in juvenile facilities when I was uh, actually my first arrest was at 13 years old. I ended up in juvenile facilities at 14. And uh, actually, the that particular time I didn't come home until I was 16 so from 14 to 16 I was away in a juvenile facility and so um, you know just coming back from that again I hadn't learned my lesson the behavioral patterns just kind of stuck with me and I just kept doing the wrong thing each time I would come home I felt like you know this time I'm not going to get into trouble and sure enough I would just you know get back into with the same crowd and doing the same kind of things and uh it got to a point where at 21 years old, um, believe it or not, I was up for my fourth adult felony conviction. And I had been through this so much already that I kind of knew the, the routine. And um, going in, I had, you know, kind of expected I was going to get a plea bargain that I would be able to accept and I would, you know, do whatever time I had to do and just come home. And they came to me with my first plea bargain agreement, and it was for 33 years. And I don't think that I understood that how much like my habitual criminal behavior had played into what they were trying to sentence me um, on this new arrest. Uh, it wasn't that the significance of this one arrest was going to warrant that kind of time. It was the habitual criminal behavior. 
And so I, I went to trial. It took seven months to get to trial and I was guilty. And uh, I had been praying the whole time. I'm like, come on now, let me please let me do like five years or something that I can recover from. I can't do this much time. And uh, my daughter had been born uh, in a previous uh, prison sentence. So I was actually in jail when she was born and I wanted to get home to her. And, you know, I had prayed and prayed and prayed and I got to trial and um, the witness, the victim actually came into the courtroom, looked right at me and said, the person that did this is not in the courtroom today. And I actually went home the same night. And in that moment, like everything changed for me. Um, there's a book by Jocko Willink called Extreme Ownership. And uh, I'll tell you, that's exactly how I felt in that moment. I felt like if it was to be, it was going to be up to me. And that everything that I had done has nothing to do with what I can do. And I had to work my ass off because I had three felony convictions and I had a lot working against me. But I truly believed for the first time ever that there was something great out there for me to accomplish. And that was the reason why I was spared. And um, it was hard, man, Brian, it was, I was so difficult because with three felony convictions, I'm trying to get a job and I would go and apply for places. And they're like, yeah, right, buddy, we're not hiring you. Yeah. And so this is how I got my first job. I actually borrowed a suit off of my cousin who is, you know, like five inches tall. He's like six, two. Um, and I'm five, nine on a good day. Like, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, not a good uh, fit for me. So I, I put on this suit, I got a haircut from a guy in the trailer park. Um, and I just started showing up to places that I thought might employ me that might hire, might hire me if given the chance. And I would just walk in and I'd say, I'm here for my interview. And they'd be like, you know, you don't have an interview scheduled. And so I was so convinced, like I had scheduled this interview you know, and confirmed it. Like I just had accepted the time and everything. So I would say back to them, oh, I apologize, but I did. I scheduled my interview for 11 o'clock and no worries. I'll just have a seat here and I'll wait. And, um, and I landed my first job that way. Um, just showing up with a suit on saying I'm here for my job interview. And I just, again, it was an example of that ownership. I didn't, I, I didn't want to make any more excuses. I've been making excuses my entire life. I had this chip on my shoulder my entire life. I blamed the world on everything I had been through. And I just felt like it was so liberating when I realized that it's nobody else's fault that I had gone through what I had gone through. It's, it's my responsibility. You know, I have to go and make this right. And, um, you know, I got my first job that way, worked my way up the nine to five until I started my business. And, uh, the business was started with not much money in my basement. And um, we just, we worked our ass off. I mean, you know, again, before the call, we had a moment to chat for a few minutes and, you know, I give all credibility to my team because they make it, they make it possible, but it's, it's exploded. We were actually um, awarded last year. Uh, we were awarded one of the fastest 50 growing businesses in our state. And uh, what's really interesting about that is we were five years in business at the time and the two other contractors that were in similar businesses as myself had been in business 18 years and 25 years that won the same award. So uh, we were amongst good company. Um, I've been nominated two times as Young Professional of the Year here in this area. I now own another business uh, where I'm a partner of a company called Master Networks, which is a learning based networking group where we build relationships and that's grown. I've created tons of really phenomenal relationships in that. And, uh, you know, I just love going back. I speak at the detention centers and some of the places that I was in when I was a kid as a troubled youth. Um, I go back there and talk to those kids and try to deliver this message so that they understand that there are possibilities far beyond their current expectations. All this is really absolutely incredible. And I mean, for, for me, taking a, a minute to pause and to really just think back a second, you know, to that moment when you made this decision to take complete responsibility and just thinking about, you know, the, the dark tunnel, you know, like that, that's, a, that's an analogy that a lot of people use these days, because at the end of this dark tunnel, there is a light. Right. And if we don't focus on that light, if we don't focus at, OK, we're going to be out of this thing. Eventually, we are going to be out of this thing that we're all in right now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it could become very dark. 
right? But yet, I think your your situation, if you really, if the people that are listening to this, take a second to really think about it. You know, you grew up in a home where you had nothing. I saw pictures of it. I saw pictures of the house. Like, you know, the large majority of people who are on watching this, I'm sure have five, 10, 15 times more than you had at that point in time in your life, right? You grew up in, the, in it, it was a, uh, it was like a single row. What do you call it? It was that? a sing, single wide trailer. Um, and it was, uh, you know, not in the best of condition. Um, you know, I, and, and I will say this, Brian, you know, a lot of people that go through what I went through uh, also have, you know, a lot of misery with it, um, you know, in, in like a really uh, abusive uh, relationship. with My parents had an addiction, but I'll tell you, like for most of my childhood, we were happy. And I really didn't know that we had so much less than everyone else until you learn that, right? Because you don't know what you don't know. And so it wasn't until I got to the age where everybody was comparing brands of shoes and, ta- you know, these kind of things before I started to realize that we were, you know, much less off than others. And, and so it wasn't until like later on, I started acting out for the attention. But for the most part, like in my early childhood, I was pretty happy as a kid. And, um, you know, I think that today I still hold on to that because my happiness today is, is not connected to any material objects or, you know, the size of my house or the car that I drive. And I really tie that back to my early childhood where, you know, it was, we were happy. We just didn't have much. And, um, you know, going in and out of foster care, there was a time where, you know, we literally, neither one of my parents had a car, neither one of my parents had a driver's license, um, a job. We actually had extension cords ran from the neighbor's house to power our refrigerator and our TV. This is, yeah, no kidding. And, um, you know, we would, I mean, like my, my dad would, 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 uh, you know, be very creative to provide for us. We ate you know, food from churches and things like that to, to really survive. But you, you know, again, you just don't know what you, do, you don't know. And uh, it wasn't until later on that I really realized that we were without so much. Um, and it, it was a very, um, you know, tough time because when you have the desire for nicer things and you don't have the right means to get them, or at least it's not taught to you, you look at what is happening around you and you do those things to try to make the money to get the nicer things. And it was, it was just a a snowball effect for me because I embraced all the wrong things and went full speed ahead with, with negative criminal behavior. But then at some point you made this decision to just completely turn it around. Right. And I I remember um, watching a video that you produced. It was absolutely incredible and inspirational where you talked about, um, you know, how you'd have to talk, you visualize yourself being the person that you needed to become. Yes. Yeah. So it was, it was really interesting. And this didn't happen until after that, you know, that, that moment where I was spared, but there were moments before that where, and and now it's like so important that I remember those moments because it's, it's, it's mind blowing because when you accept your current situation, when you accept your behaviors, when you accept the, um, you know, the expectations that you have for yourself, it can be extremely limiting. And that's what I did for myself. There were moments in my prison cell. uh, And this was like back, this was like probably, oh, 2003, 2004. So, you know, it was moments that I was in my prison cell and I would look out the window and I'd see the barbed wire across the top of the next building. And, you know, you get this little glimpse of the sun over the top of it. And I'm just, sitting there because you got nothing but to do but think and i'm in those moments and i'm looking up and i'm like you know what this is just going to be what i do for the rest of my life like this is it i'm going to be in and out of jail or worse i'm just going to be in jail for the rest of my life and oh man you know it's it's like when i finally took ownership of my life and i and and to understand and to learn that the reality of the possibilities beyond those expectations that i just accepted in that moment is just so opposite of each other like i am accomplishing things today that are so far so far beyond like what i could have possibly seen when i was released from prison like when I first was released from prison, I'm thinking, okay, I go get a job somewhere. Maybe I work there for 25, 30 years and get some kind of a retirement and I'll get by. And today, like now I'm employing other people. I'm hiring 
other people and in fact, affecting so many other people. It's, it was so far beyond. So now my, my biggest message, and we talked about this before the call is like, you know, I, my message is, listen, whatever you think your current expectations of yourself are limited to, or whatever you think your limitations are, there are possibilities so far beyond that. And when I was released, I took ownership of myself and I said, okay, I don't want to be what I've been. What do I want to be? What can I envision um, in the best form of myself and my ideal self? What would be the perfect version of myself, how I can see that today. And I really did create this image of what I wanted to be. That's kind of the reason why I put the suit on, right? I kind of, you know, manifested a, a certain level of behavior because I was dressing the way that I wanted to perform. I dressed the part of that perfect version of myself. And I always challenge people to look at that. Like if you look in the mirror and you say, okay, is what's looking back at me right now the perfect version of myself? I've never met anybody that said, yes, that's, that person is the perfect version of me because we all understand that we can do better. And if that's the case, let's break that down. Let's, let's look at what would be the perfect version of ourself. And if this is the perfect version of ourselves, then what time would I get up each day? What kind of exercise routine would I have? What kind of diet plan would I have? What kind of people would I associate myself with? How would I speak? How would I dress, right? And then you start to implement the things that are in your control. You start to do those things and then you start to work towards some of the other things. And then what happens is that perfect version of yourself continues to evolve so that you have an everlasting mission, right? Seeking this perfect version of yourself, but it continues to evolve into the things that truly make you happy, that truly make you the best version of you. And if that's the case, if we just, we owe ourselves the best version of ourselves. That is so awesome. Yeah, I also, I also remember a part of the story was very impactful where you, you said that you were selling TVs. Yes. And, yeah. and, and you took it upon yourself. And I think this is important for people to hear to completely rewire that they were like not set up correctly. And then you completely rehook them up to HDM uh, to uh, high definition, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, this part is, is really important, Brian, because I think we, we get a lot of people that, you know, hear these conversations that really apply to entrepreneurship and self-employed people. And then the people that are not in a self-employed or entrepreneurial role oftentimes reject that information. But what's really um, important about that particular story is that I took a very self-employed mentality with me into a job at a electronics retail department. Um, you know, I was far from the owner of this business, but if you asked me at any point uh, a question, I would never tell you that that's not my job. If it was in a different department, if it was in some, you know, if it was outside of my job description or responsibilities, I would never use the, it's, that's not my job. That's not my department response that you would typically get from uh, one of those associates or, or um, store um, uh, team members. And so, you know, when I got the job, right, as, as uh, showing up with the suit, it was a temporary part-time position. So I was basically being told in the same moment that I was, get, I was getting the job that I was also going to be fired eventually, right? So I had this temporary seasonal position and I knew that just like putting the suit on and showing up and earning the opportunity, I was going to have to do something to stand out and earn another opportunity. So they put me in electronics and um, I noticed quickly, and I didn't really know much about TVs at the time, although I'm a bit of a sports fan, so I can tell if the picture's clear or not. So, um, you know, looking at the TVs and, and they were really blurry, everything was really fuzzy. So, um, so I went home, I researched. Now at the time I was living with my uncle and my cousin, I was actually living on the couch there because all the rooms were full. And my cousin was actually doing night school or school online, excuse me. And so I would have to wait for him to finish on the computer. And then I would have to get on the computer after him and look on YouTube about how to set up the TVs and how to get the, the connection right. And so I would learn everything I could online after he was done school. And then I finally got enough information together that said, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And, you know, I just, I've, 
I kind of, and maybe this got me into some of the trouble that I was in, but I always had a, you know, kind of an ask for forgiveness, not for permission, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of mindset with certain things. And so rather than asking for permission to do this, I just stayed overnight. I hooked up all the TVs to high definition. I had them all running the same loop. I cleaned everything off. Um, and then the next day, you know, everything was great, but I went home. I didn't work the next day. I then spent the next day learning everything I could about the TVs because I still had so much to know. And um, when I came in the next day, this is something I think that people should take with them. I didn't keep that information to myself. I shared it with all the other associates in my department. It's not that, you know, I, I did want to stand out. I did want to um, have an impact on the people that could keep me on. But I also wanted to do it as a team. I knew that if I shared that information with someone over here, then he could sell a TV better than he otherwise would have, or she could sell a TV better than she otherwise would have. So I shared that information. TVs just flew off the shelves. I mean, we couldn't keep TVs in there. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, a couple of weeks went by and we had no TVs in the store. Anything we were selling, people had to wait for to come off of trucks. And the store manager came over and was like, you know, what's going on over here? And of course, you know, everybody in the department, even the department manager, Eric at the time, he was like, this kid, Bobby. And, um, you know, they made me a manager. Um, oh gosh, I, like I said, I can get emotional over this stuff. So this is about two to three months after I was released from prison, I was being made a customer service manager at this store, which, you know, looking, looking at that now, most people would be like, oh, so what? You're a customer service manager. No, you would have thought that I had just been made president of the United States. Like <laughs> I was so amazed and it just light bulbs went off because again, now I realize that the more I accomplish, the more I realized how much more I can accomplish. And so this idea of go as far as you can see, when you get there, you can see further, just really hit home for me. And the ownership over my life just kind of took form. And I was like, you know what? The more I try at this thing called life, the more I, you know, I can accomplish, the more I can do, the more I can help other people. And like that snowballed. So it was just it was so mind blowing for me. I know it seems so simple now, but it was so mind blowing for me that if I just put the effort in, I was really going to. So amazing. It's an incredible story. It, I it, also it, really like, it appreciate it. It still gives me chills. It's scary. It, it gives me chills too. You know? And I, I think we've all had experiences in life where success begets success, right? Once, right. when you believe in yourself, you, you know, even when you believe in yourself enough to take action, let's say, you know, I know from a weight loss perspective. So yes. if, if a person like myself really wants to get into the best shape of their lives and you just believe enough to take consistent action and you start actually manifesting your goal into reality, then it starts to push from the bottom, right? You start to actually inspire yourself to take more action. And then it starts to kind of like snowball. But likewise, many people stop themselves, right? Because even in weight loss, something, you know, is it, it, seemingly simple compared to what you did, you know, completely changed your life around. It's very challenging. Right? Very, weight challenging. Loss, very challenging, but because, yeah. you know, not only your own thoughts get in your way, but other people try to impose their will on you. And they say, hey, you know, why are you working out five days a week? Or, you know, why are you so strict? You worked out five days a week. Why? It doesn't matter if you have a slice of pizza. You, and they kind of get into your mind. And if you pay too much attention to you, it could bring down. Did you have anybody at that time that was like, you know, putting their limiting beliefs, because we all have them to one degree or another, right? Oh, yeah. You have like a friends or family members that, you know, are kind of saying, hey, you know, what are you doing? Good enough is good enough. Just keep the job. Why are you opening up a business? Yes. Yeah, so especially when I went to start the business, but even so, I mean, you know, it, when, when I walked into that store with a suit on, you know, their self, of course I had self-limiting beliefs. I'm like, you know, what the hell? You're very uncomfortable. But at the same time, like I had like I had nothing to lose. Right. And, and what that did for me. And I, I think that was the one thing I can say that, you know, is almost unfair in a certain, you know, perspective, because I, I was forced to, you know, just like, I, I had nothing, to, I had nothing to lose. I had nowhere to go, but up. And so I could move forward without much fear of failure because there was nowhere to go down, right? A lot of people, um, not only the self-limiting beliefs, which I'll answer that in just a second, their own just 
fear of failure in general, um, which is typically based around what other people think of them and, and their, um, you know, giving that power of their happiness and their control over their lives to other people and their thoughts is, is a whole nother issue. But coming back to like the, the self-love and the self-limiting beliefs and the beliefs that other people project onto you, I had an incredible amount of love for myself that was developing from every accomplishment, right? Every time that I was accomplishing something, my self-worth would grow, my self-love grew as a, as a, um, as in return, right? As a result. And so what was happening is, is, you know, I was creating this, just this, I owe it to my, the more I felt like I loved myself, the more I felt like everything I was doing, I owed to myself, right? Just like in weight loss, like you have to feel like, like you have to love yourself enough to put yourself through the workouts and the diet, right? Because otherwise, if you're doing it just because your husband said you were overweight or your brothers, like it's never going to mean as much as it is when it is for you and your own wants, interests, and, and what you, and how you feel about yourself. But when I started my business and I kind of pick on my father-in-law now, but, but it's realistic and it's well-intended too. Like it's well-intended. Like I know that when he told me that I shouldn't start my business, he meant well, you know? So when I went from at the time I was, you know, doing well, I was with another organization and I wanted to take this leap. And the question that kept getting placed on me was what if it doesn't work? And like, they had to forget. I was like, you have to forgive me, but I'm only thinking about what if it does work? You're thinking about what if it doesn't, but what if it does? Right. And so for me, again, kind of like, even though I had some to lose at this point, I was climbing. I still had that. I have nothing to lose mentality because I wasn't afraid of failure. I had seen that. Like I had been broke and I had been in the trailer park and I knew I could do that if I had to. Um, so if I had to start over tomorrow, I didn't really have fear of that because I truly believed that I would emerge from the ashes and I would come back. Um, so I just went full speed ahead when I made these decisions, I just went full speed ahead. When I started my company, we, we actually didn't even have any business cards. We didn't have anything. Right. Wow. And I said, you know, I want, in order for this to work, we got to, you know, we need action. We can't just sit here and talk about ideas and goals and things like that. We need action. Action is what's going to make this work. So I went out, I started knocking on doors. And for those of you who don't know, I own a home improvement business, um, which is predominantly a roofing replacement focused home improvement business. So I just started knocking on doors and I said, Hey, have you had your roof looked at recently? I used blank invoice statements that I bought from Staples. I used brochures and literature from the manufacturer and I just pitched the roofs and I sold roofs. And I took that money that we profited on that job and I bought business cards with it. And I bought, and I invested back into the company. I invested into myself, into trainings, into self-help and continued to learn how to, you know, I, I learned how to run a business through audio books and used books that I bought on eBay. I don't have a degree. I didn't go to any online schools. Matter of fact, I still only have the GED that I got while I was in prison years and years and years before. So, you know, for me, like I knew that I had to learn. I didn't know at all. Um, I think that, you know, we have to have that level of humility always. So I, I knew that I had to learn how to run this business. I knew I had to learn how to lead people. I knew I had to learn all these things. And so I just made an, an everlasting commitment to that. And the business has just grown and grown and grown. And, you know, we, we, um, we've got a great organization now and we've reached levels that I didn't even envision then. And now it's starting to become real of what the company can do and what some of these team members can really do and what we can do for our community. So it's, it's just been it's been huge. It's been awesome. But it was the, the self-limiting belief of someone else, right? They didn't believe they could start a business, right? So they don't want to see us start a business. Because yeah. if we start a business and they don't believe they can, they have to deal with the truth, which is they could have if they put the work in. And I think that goes for any goal that anybody, you know, it's like the people who love us most are sometimes the ones that like us the way that we are. You know what I'm saying? And they try to kind of, you know, I had this story that I heard once about the, the crabs in the barrel. I don't know if you heard, you know, yeah. if you put one crab in a barrel, it'll climb out every single time. But the minute that you put a second crab in the barrel, when that first one starts clawing up to the top, he grabs onto the top barrel, starts pulling himself out. That second crab will grab onto his leg and pull him on back down. Wow. Right? Yeah. That's the crabs in the barrel. But the other piece of inspiration that I got from your, your story is just, you know, it's not really a question of resources. It's a question of resourcefulness. 
Yes. And even in today's world, you know, I'm talking to, you know, certain business associates and such, and, you know, uh, talking about my ideas for relaunch and how we're going to come back even stronger than before. And, you know, many of these well-meaning people, you know, some of them extremely smart, like much more schooled than I am, you know, uh, they're coming to me and saying, well, you know, you got this competition over here that's half the price. You got this over here that's this, you know, but for God's sakes, if you want something bad enough, you'll knock on someone's door with a blank invoice, right? You know what I'm saying? Like even now our franchisees, for our members who are all watching this, our franchisees are doing such a fantastic job creating this virtual experience. Yeah. Like I'm in my closet right now, right? Yeah. When they do their virtual classes, it's not in a beautiful studio. Believe me, we have a beautiful studio that's being built and we're gonna relaunch with this incredible virtual studio. Like it's already in the works. But you know, um, right now some of the franchisees you know, they'll say to me, yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it, it's in my garage or it's in my, it's, it doesn't matter. It's the experience. It's the interaction. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's, it's the relationship that you've already built and that you're going to continue to move forward with and the relationship that you made. And I think that that's what you were saying. You know, it was like, you just knocked on the door and so what if it was blank, you know, you had to garner their trust in another way. Yeah. And uh, I guess you did a great job on those jobs, right? Like, so then you, oh, oh, yeah, 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 fantastic yeah. job. And then yep, the word of mouth. Yeah. I had read a I had read a sales book um, you know, before that. And the one message from the sales book that just always stuck with me was if you are not working for a company that offers the very best in the industry, the very best product or service or whatever it may be, then you need to quit right now and go work for that company. Right. And so that meant to me, I had to always provide the best product quality and service in order for my salespeople to offer it enthusiastically in order for me to offer it with enthusiasm and pride and real belief. And that's another thing. Like I can sit here and talk about the things that I know on here and I could talk to a huge crowd, but if you asked me to talk about something I know nothing about, I would have to say no, because it's the enthusiasm and the pride and the belief in what I'm delivering that makes it energetic and enthusiastic. Otherwise you can't transfer, you can't transfer the belief through your enthusiasm over your product and service to your prospective client. And so, you know, for me, that was one of the most important things, offer the very best product quality and service that we could. And that way, you know, there was never a time where my, my team member was going to leave and work for somebody who offered a better product or service. That's so exciting. Yeah. That's so amazing. So I always okay. tell people, and not to interrupt, but just to, because it's just to frame it up. I, I tell our, our, our franchisees that uh, there's three criteria that they have to meet in order to come into organization. One is, uh, you know, their financial goals have to match the opportunity that we're presenting, right? If they're looking to make X, and this opportunity offers why it's not a match. It's going to be this. It's, it's not going to be a happy relationship, but Very B smart. is passion. And that's what you're talking about. Like you got to have a passion in our business for helping people live happier, healthier, more fulfilled lives. Because in times like this with, when we're hit with COVID, like it's that passion that's going to carry you through and bring you to the other side. But the last part, which I think you spoke to very fantastically here is you've got to really have it in you to strive to be the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that you really, you set out to create a business where, you know, your world was Delaware, right? Like your mm -hmm. town in Delaware, what town is it? I'm in Dover. Our office is in Dover, Delaware. We serve the, the whole state though. So, so the whole state of Delaware. So in Delaware, you strive to be the absolute best. And if you're the best in Delaware, by all intents and purposes, you're the best in the world. And those three things combined literally make you unstoppable. But where I think it applies to most people watching this is I think that same formula could be applied to you know a person's life. You know, do something that you're passionate about, do something that you really think you could be the best in the world at, and do something that that provides you a financial return to get all the things on your dream list, so that you feel you know. And it's it's more. I mean, I could tell like in talking to Bobby, you know, in, in the in the in the, this short time and in the times we've talked before and the videos I've watched, this is a guy who's definitely built an incredible business. But also, when I say incredible. It's a business that provides for you financially, I would guess for sure, but then it fills you up spiritually. You're doing something important for your employees, probably even your customers, for your community. Yep. It's it's been huge. And that since the since day one, well, I say day one, more year one, um, 
we established a relationship with Habitat for Humanity. So as a roofing business, we've been donating four roofs per year to Habitat for Humanity since the beginning. And so, um, you know, I think that's extremely important. And a, a lot of people stop themselves in by way of community and charity because they, they feel like they have to contribute in specific ways. And I always say, like, find what matches up with your current efforts so that you can, you know, help but use your resources to help, right? So like in the very beginning, I didn't have the time to go back to the detention centers. And quite honestly, I didn't really have the success yet or the credibility yet to even deliver that message. So it wasn't like in the beginning, I could just go to the detention centers and start talking to people and delivering this message. Um, it, that wasn't the time. But my, my vehicle for contribution was my current efforts. My current efforts were, let me deliver this exceptional roofing system to our neighbors in our state, but also, if I'm doing that, let me play my part over here. The other side of that was, you know, we originally discussed trying to come up with a way to donate to, you know, people in the area that might be, you know, in need, but we didn't want to, we didn't really have the time or the resources to qualify those individuals. And so partnering with a company like Habitat for Humanity, an organization like Habitat for Humanity allowed us to, for, it gave them the time to vet those people and make sure that they were you know, the right people to help. And we were able to play our part in their mission. And, um, you know, it's been huge. It's been huge for the team. Um, you know, we, we've had team meetings where we actually get to see, you know, the families in that house and, and understand the impact that our efforts are having, um, you know, on a big picture uh, platform. So, you know, that part's been huge. I, I think all successful entrepreneurs have a contributing mindset, right? And we look to contribute through whatever service we provide. So when we actually do sign a contract with somebody or we land a deal with somebody, we truly understand that we are serving, we are we are going to help this person. And then, you know, us as entrepreneurs, we use our company and our service as the vehicle for that servant mentality, that mindset of contribution that we all really seem to possess. That's awesome. I could tell you, I, mean, I don't know if you've experienced the same thing, but you know, um, the Max Challenge you know, gives back as much as we possibly could to our communities. Um, one of the projects we do in our, um, in, in our corporate office is, is we give a little bit to, uh, my, my son went to a, a private school. He was very fortunate um, that I was able to provide that for him at the point in time that he needed it. And he was in a class of five people. I'm not talking just his classroom, yeah. But the class, like he graduated, his senior class graduated with five people. Started thinking like, how awesome would it be if we could provide that opportunity to somebody who didn't have the financial means, right? And sort of think about it, it was an expensive endeavor. I said, but what if we could just do it for 1% of that, you know what I'm And then the next year, if we could up it up to 5% and the next year, 10% of tuition and the next year, you know, so start, I, I start to think, what if we start to act like the company, kind of like your, your blueprint, actually, your blueprint thing. What if we started to act like the company that we wanted to be? And I'll tell you, you know, those days that we contributed in that way, and we realized that we were giving back and we were helping somebody, you know, we would all come into the office and, 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 and all the people would come into the room and, and we would talk about it. And it would lift us up. It would make us feel just as good as the person. And that's kind of like, you know, the, that snowball effect, you know, yes. where you're building up your own self pride and you're like, wow, you're contributing. And in times like this, when, you know, business is down, like business at the max challenge uh, in terms of dollars and cents is down 60% or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So tremendous amount of money, right? Yeah. However, what's keeping it going, at least for me, I know that I'm making, I, I have a very good feeling that I'm making a contribution to the people on the other end that are engaged in the virtual experience. I know that I'm making a contribution to the franchisees and we're going to come back even stronger and do even bigger and better things for our community. And that is more of a driving force for a lot of people. It seems like it is for you too, that, you know, if you could tap into that power of gratitude that you're able to give back and you have the personal power that can be very helpful to people in these times. Yeah, absolutely. And Brian, I want to kind of tap into what you were just talking about too. Um, you know, it is, it is extremely important, kind of going back to what you were saying about being the best and offering the best and this and that. If you truly believe that about what you're doing, then you owe it 
to your client. You owe it to the person that you're not doing business with yet, right? And that's the part I feel like people need to understand is it, even in times like these where you don't want to come off as insensitive and you do, you know, you want to understand what's going on um, and, and be mindful of that, you, it, you also have to realize that you owe it to the people that need to change their lifestyles and create a healthier lifestyle and create a better, more fit version of them, they need to hear from you in order for them to make the changes necessary in their life. I mean, let's all face it, you know, theoretically, the, the, the more fit an individual is right now, the better off they are in regards to this COVID situation. So if that's the case, then we really do owe it to each person to make an effort. Now, I'll put this in kind of an example for me. Now, I live in you know a, a residential neighborhood where there's tons of other homes around me. I own a roofing business, and of course, I see the roofs that need to be done. But those are my neighbors. I don't want to go knock on their door and bother them, right? Because they're my neighbors. Well, a couple of weeks goes by, and I happen to take a different way out of the neighborhood than I typically do. And I saw that one of my competitors, that's usually twice my price and half the warranty, had done a roof for one of my neighbors. The dumpster was still in the driveway, okay? And it had been numerous days since the project was completed. I instantly felt like I let my neighbor down. Do you understand? Like I didn't knock on the door. I exactly I was going to yeah. be invasive and intrusive and I was going to bother them. It turns out I owed it to them to knock on their door. So what I would say is if you feel like you don't want to bother somebody in this time, if you truly believe in what you're offering, if you truly believe and know that what you're offering by way of the, the max challenge and the fitness, like, it, you owe it to that person to at least make the phone call, chat with them, have a conversation. Maybe you don't call them and say, hey, where are you at? I need you guys to get this agreement signed and we're going to get to work right away. You just reach out. You just look to develop the relationship. Yesterday, I, I taught um, with our Chamber of Commerce about the power of relationships right now more than ever before, right? And I feel like one of the reasons why my company just came off of the biggest March we've ever seen and we're actually having a phenomenal April is because of the relationships that we have and the insulation that those relationships have created for us, you know? Now, we don't have to necessarily reach out and make that phone call because somebody's advocating for us who's experienced it and who knows that we've created, you know, that we're going to take good care of them. I would ask, you know, I would ask your, your franchisee owner or your franchise owners, um, you know, make those calls, like reach out to people, ask for the introductions. This is about relationship building, not the transaction right now. This is about relationship building. This Agree is about- you. What can I do? A zillion percent. It's like, it's so exciting too, you know? And I, I, I think for, for people, all people, right? Like, right. Oh now, yeah. 100% there's so, everyone. There's so much downtime. And, and you could look at it. Like, I think looking back on your story, not to, you know, cause I can't put myself in your shoes. I've never had a similar experience, but just looking back on it and tr trying my best to see it through, you know, you started off, you said in two, 2002, like you started, you got the job or something like that. I got released from prison in 2007. In 2000 and freaking seven. It, that to me was is like yesterday. Right. You know no, what it, I'm it, it like, that's like nothing. It's, it is. And what it's you've like, done was, to turn yourself, then you went and you got a freaking job. Then you went and, and opened up a business. Then you, you turn that business into basically, you know, a, a well-known, you know, powerhouse of a bit. It's absolutely incredible what you've achieved. The most, the most mind blowing moment for me was almost exact, almost exactly 10 years after I was released from prison, I was nominated young professional of the year in my area. It, and that's sick because if people really think about it, it's like somebody applies for a job and it, it says that you have a criminal background, you have to check off a box or whatever. It's very difficult to get a job. Right, because right. you, 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 you don't get the opportunity to build a rapport or a relationship or sell yourself or even have the discussion. You were told no before you ever asked, really. Yeah, that's right. And so people need to put it into perspective. It's like, but you, di you didn't take no, you just went to the next step and said, okay, well, who do I have to become? And then you, you started to formulate this idea with the suit and the whole thing. And you showed up like, like you had an interview, but you had no interview scheduled. You put yourself out on a limb. I mean, this is crazy. And then, 
you know, you get the job. It was uncomfortable. I, I think say that again. I said it, it was very uncomfortable. And I think that we have to want what we want bad enough to get uncomfortable. And I don't think enough people do. I don't, I don't think enough people are willing to get uncomfortable for what they want. I agree with that hundred percent. And then, you, and then you took a freaking step further and you, and you took your job and said, I'm going to treat it like I own this place. And you figure it out with no background, no experience. I mean, I'm sitting here trying to figure out which button to push on zoom. And you figured out how to hook up all these TVs correctly. So it had a better image. You clean the whole thing off. You learned how to sell the TVs. You became the manager of the place. <laughs> and then you just kept going and going and going. And, and, you know, in these times, people should hear a story like this. I hope, I hope. And they should grab on to th that word hope, right? And have faith. And when I say faith, I mean faith, belief in yourself and your own abilities enough to take action. Like you said, and just move forward one step, a second step, a third step. What, what, how did you say it? Like, you know, that first achievement allows you to see how. Yeah. So it's a couple of them. Like the more you accomplish, the more you realize how much more you can accomplish. Right. And there's a, there's a major saying that says, go as far as you can see. And when you get there, you'll be able to see further, keep going. Kind of like what you were talking about when you guys first started your charitable, you know, contributions and you started with the small, but then once you did that, you're like, oh, wow, well, we can do this, right? The more you did, the more you realized how much more you could do next year. And it just keeps, it keeps happening. So like, again, you know, where, when I first was released from prison, the best thing I saw was getting a job and then holy smokes. Well, now I can see this manager position. Well, now I can see this. And I just kept climbing because I could, I, I realized that there, the possibilities kept growing every time I grew, right? So I could see further. You know, I got there, I could see further. I'm like, oh, okay, well, now I, I got to keep going. So awesome. now I can see further. That's so awesome. I want to bring this to, to, we have to wrap up. Haley's uh, signaling me that we have to wrap up in a second. So I want to, I want to like hit this home for our member, for our members here, because most people have kids. Most of the people we're talking to have kids, right? Yep. And I've been telling them, and I'm interested to get your perspective on this point of view. My point of view is this, right? Like, you know, we're all in, in a situation, all of us are dealing with something. Those of us with jobs, a lot of people being furloughed. A lot of people don't know, um, you, you know, what the future holds for them. You know, I own a business. It's down 60%. My franchisees own businesses that are down substantially. I'm telling people like, look, our kids are watching us very closely. And if they're anything like my kids, they're not listening to us at all. They, they really don't. They don't listen to me at, at too much, right? but they see me get up every single morning in the face of uncertainty and move forward. Right. And to me, this is very compelling because it's like, mm -hmm. heck, you know, your, your daughter, you have uh, two kids now. I have, yeah. I have two daughters, two daughters, your daughters hear, hear your story. They see you getting up in the face of whatever it might be. They see you moving forward. And you know what? It's sending a very clear message to our kids. And the message in my mind is this, it's, you know, when your back is up against the wall, when you think you don't have options, you always have options. You don't, you have an option to crawl into the corner and suck your thumb and, and kind of, you know, fall victim to the fear, fall victim to the uncertainty, or don't feed the fear, don't feed the uncertainty, fear, uh, feed the courage that exists within every single one of us. Feed yeah, the yeah. side of us that says move forward anyway. And we're giving them, we have the opportunity during this time that some of us are furloughed off of work, whatever, have a little bit more time at home, obviously. We have the opportunity to set an example and to make a permanent imprint on their minds. When your back is up against the wall, keep going, be strong, set an example. We will persevere, we will prevail. What are your thoughts on that? Closing so, it out. So a couple of things. One, you know, when you're when you're talking about the relationship we have with our children, I always relate this to kind of like, you know, you always see when there's like a coach. Um, whose, you know, son is the, a quarterback or, you know, an athlete on the team that he's a little bit harder to coach than the rest of the team, right? Because he's been hearing it his whole life. Like he's been, he's heard it from the same source. So it's, it is really interesting how, you know, we could say something to our children and, you know, Brian, you and I could switch for a second. I could say the same thing you've been saying to your kid, to them, and they might, they're going to hear it from me because they haven't been hearing it from me. And my kids would hear it from you better than they would hear it from me because it's just so, you know, so much. They've been hearing the disciplinary stuff. They've been hearing the congratulatory stuff. And so it gets 
just so stagnant in the delivery. So I think that having an outside source deliver uh, certain messages to your children, I think is really important and finding ways to get that vehicled to them is very important because, you know, again, I think that when they hear it from us as the parent over and over again, it just gets, it becomes too, you know, redundant, repetitive, and, and they just, it gets watered down. The, the message gets watered down no matter the words. And so, um, so I think you're right. Leading by example is kind of the best way that we can do that. But also like I find exciting ways to incentivize um, with my kids so that they do get that message. For example, you know, I've been encouraging my oldest, she's, she's going to be 16 in August. And, you know, I've, I've had the conversation about ownership of life and how like at, you know, in a few years, you're going to have to make decisions for yourself and this and that. And we've talked about school and whether that's the, you know, what she wants to do and, and all those different things. And so um, one of the things that we've talked about is like, how to be creative because, you know, she wants to earn money of her own. She went and got her babysitting certificate and she was babysitting kids because luckily for her, she was the oldest of all the kids around us. So she was able to capitalize on that. However, right now that's not available to her, right? So what she's done is she started to learn um, Premiere, Adobe Premiere. And what's really interesting about this is I've been able to have her edit some of my videos. Wow. It's been really interesting because now I'm like watching her edit some of my videos. And when I say so certain things, I'll see her kind of smile and nod. It's almost as if she's getting ah, the same message and it's it. because it's coming a different way. Yeah. She's hearing it and she's receiving it differently. So, you know, it's really interesting the impact that we can have um, in, in different ways. And I think it's important as parents to be very creative in the delivery of the messages that we're trying to that we're trying to deliver because again you know when when we're and it's the same thing with relationships in general i think that you know there's certain things i could tell my wife that she's not going to hear the same way if she, as if she heard it if she heard it from someone else um just because of the influences that we have in our relationships um and and you know i think that's important for us all to be aware of so that we can be creative in the delivery of those messages in our relationships um so, you know, I think, you know, right now, I think it's, it's really important to show them that there's nowhere to hide, right? Like this is unfortunate. We do all have to stay home and we have to adjust and adapt, but I can't hide from this on the other side of this real life happens again and, and, and the bills need to be paid. And, and my team is still depending on me to provide an employee. Like there's so much riding on our decisions each and every day. And I think that, you know, all of us kind of progressed through this as this whole coronavirus developed, there was this instant like, oh, wow, okay, this is probably being blown out of proportion. And then there was this time where we all got extremely worried about the economy right? We're like, oh my gosh, what is this going to do to the economy? And then I think for most of us anyway, there was this reality set, set in of how serious this was. And then it was like, holy smokes, like, you know, yes, I'm worried about the economy and our business and our livelihood, but we need to protect ourselves and be safe and follow the requirements. And so there's there's been this evolution of emotions that we're all kind of dealing with and processing through. And I think as we process back into how do we rebound, how do we survive and emerge on the other side of it, it is important that we lead by example for not just our kids and our family, but for our team and the people that are impacted uh, just because they are watching and waiting to see. I think it's also, there's a lot of opportunity. We started talking about this before the before we started going live there's a lot of opportunity right now that people aren't understanding that you know there's things that we're implementing in business right now that will survive that will live on permanently right regardless of the quarantine because of the convenience of it this is a great example i mean you think that there won't be more people using zoom after this quarantine you think there won't be more people connecting virtually after this quarantine even though they're right down the street from one another, of course they will be. So there's going to be an adjustment. There's going to be moments and, and opportunities to capitalize on it. And I think that too many people are in retreat mode that they have to understand that, you know, when you retreat, there's a time where you also have to fire back as well. And, you know, don't forget to fire back. I love it. I love it. Well, folks, we're pretty much out of time, but I have to say this, look, I once heard this uh, saying, it's a little corny, but it, it was, uh, you can't fly with the eagles if you hang out with turkeys, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what this is about. Every, every Friday, bringing people like Bobby on here, who's an incredible inspiration 
to, you know, open our minds up to the possibilities, okay? And uh, we've got so much in our advantage, every single one of us, we're hopefully all healthy. We're, um, you know, uh, got a lot of advantages being Americans for sure, right? We live in the strongest country in the world and we will prevail, we will come out of this and we will come out of it stronger than we were before. Let's open up our minds to the possibilities and let's just go out and get it. We owe it to ourselves. Like Bobby said, we owe it to ourselves and to our family and to our community and to our country as well. All right, that's it, folks. Signing off. Thanks again, Bobby. And I Thank you guys for having me. It was a pleasure. Um, you know, if you guys, if you guys want to connect with me on social media, um, you can find my Facebook page by uh, Mr. Brightside, uh, Bobby Jones. The name of my company is Brightside. So I was dubbed Mr. Brightside years ago and it just stuck. So, awesome. uh, and uh, my YouTube channel is Mr. Brightside as well. So thanks guys. It was a pleasure chatting right. with you, Brian. We'll also make sure that we put it in the comments section also so people can get it there. Haley, make sure you do that. All yeah. right. Thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure. Great time chatting with you, Brian. Thanks again, Bobby. Take care.